All right, so I would like to welcome everyone. And we already have a good showing in this, in this particular first workshop of our Digging Up Data series, which is data literacy for archeologists and other historical disciplines. I am really excited about the sessions that we're putting together. Next slide, slide please. I would like to begin with an acknowledgement that I am broadcasting today from Orlando, Florida, um, which was with, for which uh, the Timucua and the Seminole peoples are the traditional caretakers of the land. Next slide, please. We'll begin with a few housekeeping issues. I would like to let you know that we are recording and sharing this workshop. We also ask that you keep yourself muted throughout unless you are speaking or participating in one of the breakout sessions. Please use the chat for questions and relevant comments. We also ask that if you have uh, questions, uh, you put them in the chat and we'll save these uh, for the correct parts of the session. We would also ask that you take a look meeting at- joint uh, uh, bolo mat. Uh, We would like to ask everyone to put mute their microphones at this time. All right. So we uh, would like to ask you to please see the ACER code of conduct for the expectations of this session. Next slide, please. I'll begin by introducing myself. My name is Tiffany Early Spadoni, and I am the chair of the Early Career Scholars of ASOR. If you're not familiar with the organization of ASOR, we are the American Schools of Overseas Research, and we conduct a lot of research, much of it focused on the ancient past in uh, the wider uh, Mediterranean basin. Um, I am the chair of the Early Career Scholars of ASOR, and we welcome you here today. If you're not already an ASOR member, uh, we would like to invite you to become so, and we have wonderful discounts available for our student postdoctoral and early career scholars members. I'm also the chair of the ASOR Digital Archaeology and History Standing Session. Consider this uh, as an invitation to submit future papers. Um, and I am an assistant professor in digital history at the University of Central Florida. Next slide. Yes. So today's session is part one in a three workshop series that we have put together. I, along with my co-moderator, uh, Lee Lieberman of Open Context, uh, who I will introduce in just a moment. Um, we have put together this series of sessions. The first one today is data literacy for archaeologists. Next time on October 20th, we'll be doing working with archaeological data. And finally, and perhaps my personal favorite, uh, we'll be dealing with telling stories with archaeological data on November 10th. Next slide, please. So in today's session, we're going to cover um, some good territory. We'll start with introductions, and then we'll dig into our data. Uh, we'll discuss the what's and why's, data types and formats, open and restricted data, data collection methods, uh, data quality, the you know, perennial favorite topic of metadata, um, ethical considerations, and then we'll finally uh, discuss takeaways and next steps. Next slide, please. Hi. Now it's on to me. <laughs> oh. Um, there, I I was meant to introduce you. Have have we removed your introduction slide? I moved that here. Here we go. <laughs> oh, yes, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I am so pleased and delighted to introduce my co-moderator today, Lee Lieberman, who will be leading you through this topic. Um, Lee is, has a BA and MA from the Johns Hopkins. Has a BA. Hello has a BA and an MA from the Johns Hopkins University. She has a PhD in classical art and archeology span from Princeton. She is presently the director of um, strategic partnerships at Open Context and um, is also the data management supervisor for the American Excavations at Morgantina Contrada Agnese project. And she is also the manager of data and information resources for the Pompeii Archaeological Research Project, Porta Stabia. Uh, without much further ado, I would like to introduce my esteemed colleague, Dr. Lee Lieberman. 
Thank you, Tiffany. And thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm going to go back to that uh, last slide for a second, if I can, um, just to give a brief land acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge that the Tongva peoples are the traditional caretakers of the land from where I am Zooming today in Claremont, California. Um, as someone who resides on unceded indigenous land, I recognize that I have and continue to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. And I honor not only the history of the land, but also the Tongva people that are thriving members of the community today. Um, so Tiffany, that was a fantastic introduction. Um, just a, a little bit of, of summary there. I am an archeologist whose research explores how and why artifacts and spaces were recycled and repurposed in the ancient Roman world. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about my disciplinary background, but the broader principles that I'm gonna be referencing are widely applicable to archeologists and historians and, and people that are interested in studying the ancient world more broadly. Um, and that's actually one of the first important takeaways about data literacy is that a lot of the concepts that we're gonna be introducing today are really widely applicable to a broad range of disciplines. Um, I'm also, as Tiffany mentioned, the Director of Strategic Partnerships for Open Context. We are a small nonprofit that promotes open data initiatives and cultural heritage. And I want to take just a brief opportunity to introduce you to the rest of the team that I'm representing today. Um, if you're signed up already and able to attend subsequent programs in the Digging Up Data series, I'm hoping that some of them might be able to make an appearance, especially concerning some of our current work in the data literacy program that is being led by Megan and Paulina. Um, and that project in particular is the launch of the Digital Data Stories Project. If you are immediately curious about what that program is and what that, pro what that project consists of, um, you can definitely check out our blog for more information. Um, one of the things that you might have seen on the slides as Tiffany was going through before and as I started is this link to slides down at the bottom. If you wanna follow along with the slides on your own device, please feel free to check out that link. Um, I have tried to embed a lot of links throughout the presentation. Um, some of the ones that are not as user-friendly to read and type, um, you can definitely click through if you have access to the slides. So I encourage you to do that. Um, and you'll also have access to them after the presentation is over. Um, but to get started, I wanna jump off with a poll just to take the temperature of the room and our, our virtual room, so to speak. Um, and this poll is gonna have three questions. So the first one, How much formal technical training have you received around working with data? Um, so take a second just to think about that. In my mind, none means the word data is a little new to you and incredibly scary and you, you don't know what a spreadsheet is. A lot might mean that you are a computer science buff and you have a degree in statistics. Um, so wait a second for those answers to come in. I was gonna say, you guys are, are quick to answer this poll, but I realized for many of you, you're not zooming in from the California time zone where I'm still on my first coffee of the day. Um, excellent, so we've hit critical mass there. And as I suspected, can you all see those, those poll answers? As I suspected, we're kind of in the middle. Um, and, and I think that that, ends up being the standard story that I've heard around data for archeologists and data for people that study the ancient world. Um, a lot of the skills that I picked up as the data manager for various archeological projects, I picked up on the fly. I never really took a class to learn this sort of stuff. Um, the second question that I wanna address, how important do you think being able to work with data is for you and your career goals? on a scale from very unimportant to very important. Uh, 
Um, again, we've kind of hit critical mass on those answers. So I'll go ahead and close the poll and share the results. Um, so again, as, as one might guess, you're all here for a reason, right? You think that data is important in your careers. Um, so the, the general temperature of the room seems to, to play that out. Um, the last question, how important, or sorry, how comfortable are you working with data? Excellent. Um, so a whole range there. And I think this is another thing that really characterizes our experience as archaeologists with data. Some of us who have had experience working on data-driven projects, we develop that familiarity, we develop that comfort. Um, but a lot of us are more in that middling range where, where you know, it's, it's not necessarily second nature yet. Um, excellent. Well, thank you for your answers there. And we will have a couple more poll questions throughout um, to, to kind of take your temperature on things. Um, but I want to dig in then to the what and the why of data literacy. Um, and we'll start off with just a couple definitions. Um, so data we define as an object, a variable, or a piece of information that has the perceived capacity to be collected stored and identifiable. Data can be structured and unstructured. Data can be big and small. Data can be qualitative and quantitative. And we're gonna go through what those mean in just a bit. Um, but we'll keep coming back to the broader social context of data throughout our discussion today. Um, so use this as an anchor. Um, data literacy, the reason why we're all here today, is the ability to engage constructively through and with data. Um, in other words, data literacy is the ability to read, to work with, to analyze, and to argue with data. Data literacy do not, and data in general, do not necessarily rely on technology and advanced computational tools. Data can be collected using analog formats that you may or may not digitize later. Um, and likewise, data literacy is more about a general attitude about and familiarity with data rather than expertise about specific digital tools and specific methods of analysis. Um, so the big elephant in the room, one of the questions that, that this workshop aims to address is why be data literate? Through our work as archaeologists, we produce, we clean, we analyze, and we translate data. Um, this is well represented by the types of activities that we perform, from artifact analysis to aerial survey to excavation. Um, it's also well represented by the types of records we create, from notebook narratives to lists of finds, from photographs of specific artifacts to illustrations of entire typologies. It follows that with so many opportunities for data creation, we should understand the process behind data, the processes behind data, um, and we should be well-versed in the practices that those are going to entail. Um, another reason why we want to consider data literacy and why we want to be data literate the humanities disciplines on the whole are losing institutional support. And in many ways, it's up to us to make a case for maintaining that support. This is well illustrated by news headlines like the ones you see on the screen here. And if you've been paying attention to these stories, they're heartbreaking to, to read about and to hear about our colleagues that are losing their positions and losing funding. Um, but they're more frequent as of late. This is happening more and more. And the question of why should we study the humanities, to my mind, still hasn't been answered to the satisfaction of the people that hold the purse strings and that are actually funding our projects and, and maintaining these departments. Um, so what does data literacy then bring to the argument? 
data literacy involves not only learning about archaeology and and learning about the techniques that we can apply to our studies, um, but data literacy also involves the learning of skills that are easily transferable to a variety of other disciplines. Um, so in that sense, broader skills-based learning outcomes can enable us to attract students that may not otherwise share our innate passion for material culture and old walls and dirt and sun. Um, and this is especially important because most of our students are not going to become archaeologists. So giving them tools to and, and a, a creative outlook to walk away from our classrooms with is very, very important. Um, moreover, many of us are going to find ourselves pursuing careers outside the academy and, and outside of archaeology. And the data skills that we can acquire along the way, if they are explicit and if we understand how to market them, those are skills that are only going to strengthen our resumes moving forward. Um, so again, just to take your temperature on these things and to see how important this aspect of uh, data literacy is to us in the Zoom room right now, um, I want to just ask a few more questions. Um, and the first one is, how affected has your own research been by budget cuts? Great for those, thank you for those answers coming in. So again, all over the place in terms of how budget cuts at the institutional level are affecting our work uh, as scholars, as archeologists. And I think that that's important to see that range and to understand that we're all coming at this from, from different experiences and different perspectives. Um, the second question is equally as important. How impacted has your research been by the COVID-19 pandemic? Great, again, thanks for those answers there. Um, and I think that this is one of those, those questions that's gonna come up for a while <laughs> moving forward as, we are, as we're still living in this reality. Um, but it's important to know that uh, the, you know, the range of experiences involved and the, the difficulties that we're facing during these unprecedented circumstances mean that access to data and, and the, the curation of good data is more important than ever. Um, so thank you again for, for your responses there. Um, ultimately, um, I think one of the most important takeaways about data literacy is that it's not about learning specific tools and techniques. You will pick those up along the way, um, but rather data literacy is about developing comfort around data. Data literacy is going to require practice. A great metaphor that my colleague Paulina shared with me yesterday is that learning the principles of data literacy is like learning the alphabet, um, but you're still going to need practice writing words. And then once you figure out how to write words, you're still going to need practice composing sentences. So the practice you get, to, you get along the way really adds up. Um, and another thing I like to remember is that you don't need to know how to do everything. It's not all or nothing. Um, but you do need to start to familiarize yourself with the range of what is possible and the kinds of vocabularies and tools and systems that can help you learn the skills you need to learn. Um, that way, when the what and the how of data literacy change, the why and the principles that ground us can stay consistent. Um, so, Moving then from that kind of background introduction to a discussion of data types and formats, we're going to stay at a pretty high level during this conversation. 
um, but talk about some of the terms and, and some of the, the things that you want to think about when we're considering data types and formats. Um, so I mentioned before that data can be unstructured or structured. Unstructured data, you can see here from the graphic, has no predefined structure. Um, often when we think of big data, big data comes to us as in unstructured formats. Um, and we as researchers need to combine, need to apply our own structure to unstructured data. Um, so in our experience in particular, maybe combing through narrative-driven excavation notebooks if we're, if we're dealing with uh, legacy projects. Structured data, in contrast, is more organized, maybe tabular data. Um, so when you think of structured data, you're thinking of spreadsheets, you're thinking of comma-separated value files. Um, and ultimately, however we start out, we want to get to structured data. Um, structured data is what's going to allow us to perform analysis. It's going to allow us to share our data responsibly. It's going to allow us to communicate our findings clearly. And in order to do that, we often go through a process of data cleaning. Data cleaning is removing or correcting incorrect, incomplete, inappropriately formatted or duplicate data from a given data set. Um, there are many programs out there that can help us do this work. Um, so Open or Fine is a very powerful tool. That's just one of them. But any spreadsheet program like, uh, like Calc from LibreOffice can help us do the same thing. So knowing that there are tools out there that can help you with these processes is, is one of the first steps in the, the process to becoming data literate. Data can be big or small. Big data, we think of larger, more complex data sets. These are often collected passively. Small data, in contrast, is explicitly collected, and it's usually collected in the open and on purpose and with notice. Most of what we are probably used to working with is small data, even if we have a lot of it, even if we have thousands and thousands of artifacts or geospatial points in our data set. Um, for the sake of these definitions, it's still on the small side. Um, so just an example, uh, for comparison's sake, if you were to scrape Twitter for, say, some kind of sentiment analysis, scholars have access to over 9,000 tweets per second. This is the kind of set that we're talking about when we think about big data. Um, so even when our data sets are big, when we're dealing with a handful of sites and the materials from a handful of sites, like the search for coin in open context, we can still think of that rather on the small side. Um, and moreover, our analyses often rely on the careful interpretation of just a single artifact, what I'm calling here smaller data. Um, so we can get very granular in, in our, our analyses. Um, many of you are also probably familiar with the terms quantitative and qualitative in terms of data. Quantitative refers to measured or counted data. So think elevations, think numbers of artifacts, think the weight of pottery. Qualitative in contrast is descriptive. So the qualities of a thing, think Munsell color, think vessel part, think soil inclusions. Um, and again, just to see this in practice, We've got my colleagues at Morgantina there weighing shirts, counting shirts, quantifying them um, versus the, the excavators here in the dirt whose experience is being recorded in some narrative fashion by, by uh, trench supervisors and, and excavators. Um, so often when we think about data, we think quantitative good. And, and numbers in particular are good. But qualitative data can also be exceptionally important for the kinds of work that we're doing. Um, and, and quantitative isn't necessarily better than that. Um, so embracing qualitative data and, and thinking about how our analyses can hinge off of that kind of data is really important for our, our scholarly pursuits. Um, there's always a part in a discussion around data that I don't find particularly helpful unless it's grounded in practice, but people always want to know file types. Um, 
we're going to get into that more in our workshop next month on archaeological data analysis. Um, and, and there we'll talk more explicitly about the kinds of file types that we'll want to familiarize ourselves with and what each one of them is used for in what context. Um, but uh, I throw up a couple on this slide here because I know that's always something that, that people want to talk about. Um, overall, our data may consist of descriptions, it may consist of numbers, it may consist of scanned images, photographs, 3D models. Um, to try to come up with an exhaustive list would be a real fool's errand. It would be very difficult to do. Um, but there are examples of common types of archaeological data that we produce and encounter. Um, artifactual, ecofactual, contextual survey, spatial, and more. Um, oftentimes, there's a very consistent way of recording data. For instance, if you've studied ancient recording coins, if you've studied ancient coins, you know that numismatists have standardized the types of information that we want to record and present about a coin. However, other types of data present more challenges when it comes to standardization. Survey or contextual data may vary widely from project to project and from context to context. Um, but there are still standards that can promote consistency and interoperability, a word that we'll talk about in a second. And um, again, the collection of these data falls on a spectrum between analog and digital. Digital isn't always better if it's not backed by careful and deliberate planning. And the, the documentation of the priorities and the thought processes that go into why you're collecting the kind of data that you're collecting are very important for the integrity of the work that you're doing. Um, Database is another word that comes up when we're talking about the collection of data, in part because a database is an organized collection of that data. Databases will have a front end meant for user access and for, for input from users. Um, databases also have a back end that show you the relationships between all the records of data that they contain. Oops. And if you think about the legacy data sets that you worked with and how you wish someone had collected some kind of piece of information, you have to think about the tools that they were using to collect that and, and sort of the resources that they had access to. And it's the same when you're dealing with a digital infrastructure. Um, some of you may already be familiar with just from you know, accessing Zoom today and, and signing up for this webinar. You're used to the front end of databases, even if you don't know that they're, that they're databases that are acting in that way. The back end though is super intimidating sometimes. As someone who, who develops databases, I still get sort of chills and, and uh, nerve ridden when, when I see something like that, because um, there's a lot going on there and it requires a, a sort of background knowledge that, that takes time and, and energy to develop. Um, and when you're thinking about building databases, and, and we're not going to get into the specifics of that, because for, for a discussion of data literacy, it's also sort of the, the tail end of that discussion, right? This could be what we aim for uh, if, if that's our goal of data literacy. Um, but there are some, some pros and cons of, of certain database uh, platforms and infrastructures that you wanna take into account when you're starting any data-driven project. Um, one question that you wanna ask yourself is about cost. So how expensive is my data infrastructure, and in particular, my digital data infrastructure, going to be to maintain? Who is going to pay for that cost? Um, who is going to maintain that in the long term? Um, there's also a question of transferability. If the specific software you're using stops being supported, how can you access the data that you've collected? Um, this is important too when we think about the front end versus the back end. So many people are interested in producing their own flashy, public facing uh, project websites, but oftentimes those flashy front ends are what come and go. And then the durability of the data behind it is what's important. And that too often gets the, the short end of the stick in terms of the planning. 
Um, there's also a reason to think through the learning curve specifically for the creator of a database. So if you're responsible for creating your, your database for your research project, how difficult is it going to be for you to learn how to do this? And where are you going to acquire the skills to do that? Um, moreover, if you're creating a database that's meant to be used by more than just you, by a team of archeologists, for instance, um, you wanna think through the learning curve for the user. So how easy is it going to be for them to access the, the tools and the infrastructure that you've created? Is it something that they can easily pick up or are they going to struggle with that? And do they have the, the time and the energy to do that? Um, so as I mentioned before, data collection, database development, this is not an all or nothing process. And um, you, you don't need to leave this workshop uh, knowing how to build a database. Um, you don't need to start that this afternoon. Um, and like I said, the image of that back end of the database leaves my stomach in, in a few knots. Um, but you can do things now that can set you up for success in the long term um, in, in the initial phases of any data-driven project, actually at any part of any data-driven project. Um, and thinking through some of these important considerations, thinking through some of the tools that can allow you to do this, whether it is a spreadsheet program like the one offered through LibreOffice or an entire Microsoft Access database. These are important considerations that are gonna pave the way for your success moving forward. Um, so I want to turn from types and formats to a discussion of open and restricted data, because this weighs heavily into our conversation of what it means to be data literate and what it means for data to be a social, uh, a social offering. So open data is research data that is freely available on the internet, permitting any user to download, copy, analyze, reprocess, pass to software, or use for any purpose without significant barriers. Um, the principles behind open data are being defined in the context of big international conversations about open access to scholarly resources more generally. And we're tapping into those conversations when we talk about the importance of data literacy, whether or not we know it. When we think about the open data network, we can, whoops, when we think about the open data network, we can start to tease out some of the ways in which data is a social thing. And these sorts of ideas form the core of my organization, Open Context's mission. Um, so open data is going to promote greater visibility of your data and thereby encourage reuse of data. Moreover, if you have access to other people's data, you have access to models for how you might want to create your data set, right? So, so rarely do we start things from scratch. So being able to see those models and build off of them, um, even in terms of the way things are organized and the way data sets are set up is very important and a, a, an important consequence of open data. Um, open data also democratizes knowledge as your data now have the potential to be shared with audiences that don't have access to or barriers to access like paywalls. And open can also promote collaboration between groups that might not otherwise have known about each other's work, um, just sort of that, that uh, happenstance stumbling upon data that is relevant to your work could spur conversations and that could spur on really productive collaborations in the future. Um, linked data builds on all of this. Um, so linked data refers to a set of design principles that promote interoperability that uses web identifiers or URIs to reference shared concepts. Linked data principles encourage you to think about how your data set relates to a wider landscape of data. It's not just a technical infrastructure, but rather it's a broader methodological framework to sort of guide the decisions that you're making about your data management practices. If you think about traditional scholarly publishing 
You would never quote or reference a source without proper citation. And linked data is going to rely on some of those same principles. So when standard vocabularies, like some of the ones represented on the slide right now, have been published, linking to those standards in your own data set is not only going to save you the time and effort of recreating the wheel, right? You don't have to come up with these definitions yourself. Someone else has already done the work for you. Um, but it's also going to allow you to participate in this wider network of data-driven scholarship. Um, and, and then we go back to all of the reasons why open data is, is a good thing, right? Promoting visibility, encouraging collaboration, um, tapping into this linked network is one more piece of that puzzle that, that encourages this kind of, this kind of outcome. Um, open data, as we've talked about, is very important, but one question remains, should all data be open? Um, and there's a lot of work that, that you can look into about this. Um, photographs of human remains is one important set of, of uh, data that we might want to think about in this regard. Um, museum colleagues are having similar conversations about the remains themselves. Should they even be on display in museums or could that be potentially harmful to uh, individuals and communities? Um, one example from my own research comes from my dissertation work when I was trying to find the locations of necropolis around the site of Lentini in Sicily. And I found after conversations with a lot of community members and, and scholars working in the area that the, the real idea behind not publishing the actual spatial coordinates is one of safety. And um, this area in Sicily is subject to, and, and was subject to consistent looting in the past. And, and to keep the cultural heritage, to keep those monuments safe, um, scholars have largely decided to leave the coordinates uh, uh, in a restricted, restricted uh, set that can't be accessed by everyone. Um, so these are just a couple examples of, of instances in which we might want to question whether all data should be open. Um, but more to the point, it's important to have conversations about these concerns with your team and, and with your colleagues. It's important to learn about local and international standards that govern these kinds of questions and to establish policies for your own research and your own field projects, right? This, this shouldn't come as a surprise to you right when you go to publish um, that maybe you shouldn't be doing this. These are things that, that thinking about now is going to pay off dividends in the end. I wanna talk for a bit about data collection methods and how we actually come to have data uh, as archeologists. So, Many of us are probably coming at this from the perspective of field work um, and, and the, the actual practice of archaeology, as we know, is a destructive pursuit. So your field work practices are necessarily only as good as the data you collect because you can never get back to the remains that were under the dirt before you, you uncovered them. Um, so during field work, you and your team are going to determine the research questions, and those research questions are going to drive the architecture that you design to capture your data, again, whether that is analog or digital. Um, when you're excavating, observations are recorded by you and your team. Um, and those observations are normally geared towards the questions that you are asking. So again, that, that uh, thing that you always come back to in your field work is what is our, what is our goal here? What are our research questions? Um, however, those observations contain your own biases, your own priorities, your own interpretations. Um, this is not a bad thing, right? We hear the word bias and we automatically associate that as, as a negative concept, um, but biases on their own are not necessarily a bad thing, but they must be explicitly acknowledged. And, and knowing what your biases are, knowing what your priorities are, does help the integrity of the data you're collecting in the long run. 
Um, in addition to field work, a lot of us may be familiar with library research practices, right? When we're when we're scouring through old publications um, and, and trying to find data that way. Um, in terms of library research, another term that comes up is legacy data. Um, legacy data refers to older project data, data that has been collected in a way that might not meet today's best practices. Um, when it comes to library research on, on legacy data or, or borrowing from more contemporary publications, you are applying research questions and you are applying data architecture to a set of data that may have been collected for very different purposes. Um, you are also applying your own biases and priorities and interpretations on top of the original biases, the original priorities, the original interpretations. Um, so layers upon layers of interpretations there. And library research is often going to involve making executive decisions about what the original excavators, what these original publications meant. And part of our job is to document those decisions and, and making very explicit the choices that we made along the way. Um, whether you're in the field or in the library, your work may involve some kind of digitization of records and digitization of data. Um, digitization practices are governed by their own set of standards that are usually managed by our colleagues and collaborators in libraries and archives and visual resource departments. Um, so again, here's another aspect of the, the social nature of data. Um, data is not sort of you and, and your notebook alone in a dark room, but data is something that does have many different constituent parts and being able to collaborate in this process is an important thing to learn along the way. Um, additionally, you may be interested in finding data that is already structured in some way and the data repositories that exist uh, and, and are open have different strengths and cater to different formats. Some of them are disciplinary specific, some of them are not. Um, it helps to familiarize yourself with some of these resources that so that you know where you can look to find data for your research questions and so that you can anticipate where you might want to deposit your data when you've completed your work. Um, again, when, and I'll throw the link up again in a, in a second, but when you look at the slides for this presentation, um, all of these, uh, these logos here do have embedded links. So uh, these are just a few that I thought to highlight today, but there are more that exist out there and more that might be more relevant to your individual research pursuits. Um, so trying to familiarize yourself with that landscape is one of the first uh, most important steps in becoming a data literate scholar. Um, so as promised, there's that link to the slides one more time if you haven't already been following along and you decided you want to. Um, but one of the things that I think would be really helpful is to break up into some small groups and try to think through the reasons why you may find a particular data set trustworthy, um, the reasons why you may think that a data set contains quality data. Um, so some of the questions that you wanna ask yourself during this small group exercise that we'll, we'll send everyone off to in just a second. Um, what about this data set inspires trust? What are the fields and the headings that you know and recognize? What are the fields or headings that require more explanation? And where might you go to get that explanation? And then what research questions could you begin to address with this data set? What additional information would you want to have about it? What additional information would you like it to contain? Um, so we've got two data sets picked out for you today. And I will throw the link up in the chat just before we send you to the breakout rooms. Um, one of them is from the Architecture and Urbanism Project at Sayatoma Hoyek in Turkey. Um, and that data set considers architecture and, and uh, buildings on, on site. Uh, and then we also have a data set from the Petra Great Temple Excavations. Um, and that data set concerns the pottery, the, the ceramic assemblage.
Welcome back, welcome back. Slow and steady. Excellent. Welcome back. Um, I set it up so I can finally see your faces if your cameras are on. I couldn't see you before. So this is this is great. <laughs> um, so in the interest of uh, making sure that we get through all of our content um, and also hear from you about some of the things you and your group discussed, I want to ask you if you had feedback that you wanted to share about that exercise, things that you discussed with your group, if you wouldn't mind typing that in the chat and then other people can, can see what the different groups were talking about um, in response to those questions that we were looking at before. Um, what is this data, what about this data set inspires trust? What are the fields that you know and recognize? And what research questions could you begin to address with this data set? Um, but hopefully that gave you a chance to explore some of the, the things that we've been talking about and I think sets us up very well for what we're gonna talk about next, which is metadata and unique identifiers. Um, so, Starting out with metadata, metadata is data about data. And we can think of metadata as the tip of the iceberg in many ways, serving as an important means for us to get to the data. Um, there are three types of metadata, if we wanted to think about this categorically. You've got descriptive metadata, administrative metadata, and structural metadata. Um, descriptive, like who created this data? What is this data about? When was this data created and what is its unique identifier? We'll get into what those are in just a second. Um, administrative data could cover questions like who owns this data, who gives access to this data, and how can this data be used? And then structural metadata, how is this data set organized? What version of the data is this? And what other resources might you need to interpret this data? Um, it's really important to note the existence of traditional knowledge labels as well. Traditional knowledge labels offer community-based alternatives to existing metadata schemes, and they are a relatively new thing, um, which is why I want to point them out here. Um, traditional knowledge labels acknowledge the fact that data cannot be created and managed from the outside, so to speak. So these labels have been developed through sustained partnership and testing with indigenous communities across multiple countries. Um, so definitely worth looking into the, the importance and the, the um, sort of reach of an organization like Local Contexts and some of the initiatives that they promote. Um, overall, metadata does a lot of things for us when we're, when we're participating in this environment. Uh, metadata is going to inspire confidence like you talked about. I bet many of the things that you were looking at associated with those data sets would have been answered by those metadata questions, right? About who and, and what and, and when. Um, so metadata can inspire confidence about a data set. Uh, metadata will enhance discoverability as search engines pull from metadata to get you what you need. Um, and for that reason, metadata will encourage reuse, right? If you can find it, then you can use it. So, so it follows necessarily that it's going to encourage reuse. Um, and work being done, especially by groups like Local Context, ensure that metadata promotes ethical standards. Um, and like I said, you were picking up probably in a lot of this in the groups that you were in just a few minutes ago. Um, but one kind of big thing to, to keep in the back of your minds about metadata is that you are not intended to become an expert in metadata. We've got enough on our plates thinking about data literacy 
And metadata literacy is probably a whole discipline in and of itself. Um, so metadata is usually defined for any project in collaboration with representatives from data repositories, from libraries. And this just goes to reinforce the fact that data is necessarily a social and collaborative thing. Um, so if metadata is something that, like the back end of the database from before, seems a little, a little scary and a little finite, um, this is something that there are definitely resources out there to help you with. Um, Unique identifiers is another important quality that we want to assess when we're thinking about data. Unique identifiers are going to ensure the individuality of each record in your data set. So think about this in the context of an archaeological project where you might have a ceramicist numbering sherds and a zooarchaeologist numbering the bones that have been excavated. If they both have numerical sequences of objects, that can get incredibly confusing, not only for the people working on those objects, but especially for individuals not directly affiliated with the project who are kind of looking at this data that has been collected. Um, so when we think about unique identifiers, we want to start out at the local level and then get a little, a little bigger. Um, so when we think about local identifiers, this could be, say, a, a project-defined inventory number for an object or, or a data point. Um, local identifiers are internally defined. They are therefore internally unique. Pottery 211 is going to be different from Zoark 211. Um, and often they are human readable. So this is something that as someone who is not affiliated with this project can see, I can, I can understand what Pottery 211 refers to. Um, and and I'm, I'm sort of given the knowledge to, to understand what that thing is meant to represent. Um, a little bigger than local identifiers, though, are universally unique identifiers. And these draw on standards published by the Open Software Foundation. Um, these are computer generated. These are computer readable. This is something that I don't want to have to type out or say every time I'm referring to the vessel highlighted in blue on the screen, right? So, so it makes sense that, uh, that this is something that might be more relevant for the back end of a database than the front end. Um, getting a step even bigger, could be something like an archival resource key or an ARC identifier. ARC identifiers are persistent and they are affiliated with web addresses. And you can check out uh, sort of the standards that ARC discusses and, and the, the work that they do to build up this set of identifiers. Um, and again, this is not an all or nothing. So, We'll get in a few seconds to some actionable things you're going to be doing uh, to sort of hone your data literacy between now and the next workshop. And starting with the local is kind of a good step in that direction. And then once you build up that, that uh, resilience and you build up that system, eventually moving to something like a universal, a universally unique identifier and an archival resource key, those are kind of steps in the process. Um, but one of the final things that I want to touch on are just to summarize some of the ethical considerations that we've hinted at throughout this uh, entire workshop. Um, big questions like, can I or should I collect this data? Can I or should I publish this data? Am I being collegial in how I'm citing others, how I'm using established community standards to organize my data? Um, and I want to end just with a quick discussion of two framing principles that two sets of framing principles that can guide how we think about working with data. Um, the first are the FAIR principles. Um, FAIR principles meaning that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, these are stakeholder driven initiatives to make data all of these things. Um, and this is a great sort of way to think about some of the factors that should guide our data collection and our data curation and our data use in our own research. Um, and this is great in many ways, but it's been rightly criticized for not being enough. Um, FAIR focuses on increased data sharing 
while ignoring a lot of the power dynamics and historical contexts behind data collection and behind data publication. And this creates tension, especially for indigenous peoples who are also asserting greater power control over the application and use of indigenous data and indigenous knowledge for collective benefit. Um, so more recently and, and less widely discussed, are the care principles. These come out of this, this context and that this tension. Care principles focus on collective benefit, authority to control, responsibility, and ethics. And learning more about the, the uh, sort of principles that can only enhance the way we work with data um, is, is a good thing. Um, and again, this isn't all or nothing. So making small adjustments to your habits and your practices to make sure that they reflect these principles now will go a really long way to you fully mastering them down the road and to you having data sets that you're really proud to have collected and contributed to and to sharing. Um, so just to summarize, I wanna, end with a discussion of what you can do now, because a lot of this is sort of setting us up for success in the future. Um, but there are some immediate takeaways that I want you to think about uh, right after the workshop and, and in the coming weeks before we turn to our next topic in October. Um, one of the first things that I want you to do is to explore an open data repository to find data relative to your research. Um, so some of the ones are represented in one of the slides earlier in this presentation. Open context is one that we would love to have you explore, but we are not the only open data repository out there. And the choice for you might be different based on your own disciplinary expertise. Um, so finding an open data repository and just looking through it, seeing what they have, seeing how it's organized um, is a good step in trying to familiarize yourself with this kind of work. The next thing that I want you to do is to identify or establish a standard system of local identifiers for data that you may have produced or data that you are working with. Um, so if you're lucky, the data that you're working with might already have something like this, but if not, now is as good a time as ever to, to think about implementing that field and, and trying to come up with it. It's a consistent system that works for you or works for you and members of your team. Um, the third thing I want you to do, and this goes back to the uh, trustworthiness of data, is to brainstorm the kinds of metadata you would want to be sure to include and publish with your data set. Um, so, this goes back to one of the things we were saying about practicing, right? And, and sort of going through and finding data sets that you can use as models for the work that you're going to do. So seeing what other people have, have done in the past, seeing how that can inform your work is just another step in the right direction. Um, I've also included in the slides a number of resources that I find particularly helpful when thinking through why data literacy is so important for me in particular and for, for the discipline of archeology span in general. Um, some of them I've referenced throughout the presentation, but uh, you might want to take an opportunity to read or listen to some of those sources moving forward, um, just to, to familiarize yourself with some other voices on this topic. Um, and then the last step is that you can attend our upcoming workshops. Um, I think that we're going to have a lot of experience over the next couple of months thinking about why this is important and thinking about building the toolkit that we're going to need in our research and in our scholarship. Um, so attending these additional workshops, coming with questions that, that we can address in follow-up emails, um, sharing this information with your friends so that you can, and your colleagues, so that you can have conversations around this very important topic um, that, that's gonna definitely speed your way down the data literacy path. Um, and 
that's all I had for you today. I, we will follow up with this in email, but um, we have created a reflection survey just to, again, take your temperature on, on what you thought of this workshop and the kind of content that you'd like to see from us moving forward. Um, so if you wouldn't mind taking a chance to submit that survey, it's short, shouldn't take you too long. We really value and appreciate your feedback. Um, the questions that you've entered in the chat, because we're out of time, we won't uh, address them now, but if you have any additional questions, feel free to type them in. And we're going to follow up with a blog post, actually, that, that discusses this event and, and addresses some of those questions. Um, so we'll be sure to send out that information. But in the end, thank you all for attending. This has been great to talk about. Um, this is something that we're very passionate about, and I really look forward to some of the conversations that we're going to have over the next couple months with you. Take care.